I don't think that you would be interested in science if it wasn't pragmatically useful. You see, and that's, that's exactly the point that I want to pursue in this lecture today. It's like, we are interested in things generally as a consequence of their perceived utility. You know, now, the ends, the framework within which you determine utility is quite malleable. So, for example, if you're suicidal, you might regard it how sharp a knife is as the primary object of interest. But generally speaking, you know, we would assume that, especially if you're a Darwinian thinker, that your primary interests are something like survival and reproduction. And, you know, I don't think that's an unreasonable assumption. Um, the terms are quite elastic, so you can throw a lot of motivations in them without, you know, without having to think that rigorously about it. But as a, as a heuristic framework, it's not bad. So, and so part of the reason that Jung believed that science was embedded in a dream, which was the alchemical dream fundamentally, was because he believed that the people who developed the symbolic precursors to science, and so those would be the alchemists, Newton was an alchemist, by the way, um, were looking for something approximating the Philosopher's Stone, which was a material object which would grant its bearers eternal life and good health and wealth. And so, the, the alchemists were the first people, in some sense, to posit that if you systematically investigated the transformations of the material world, which was regarded more or less as damned by the Catholic Church, that you could extract out information that would be of substantial benefit to the things I just described, health, wealth, and longevity. And so, you might say, well, why are we pursuing science? Like, why are we motivated to do it? Why would you spend 10,000 hours looking through a microscope? It's a very weird thing to do. And the, the Jungian idea is, well, if you go right down to the base of the, of, the, of the hierarchy of motivation, you're doing it to make the world a better place in some manner that's important to you. So, you can't, science has to be net nested inside a motivational structure or no one would do it. Now, you, you know, you can think about that what you want, but, but it's not an argument that you can easily dismiss because you have to account for why people are interested in science, you know, and if you say, well, it's because they want to build a career, that's fine because it just nests inside the same argument anyways. Okay, so, now, so we kind of have a definition of reality from a materialist perspective. Now, there's a few problems with that, right? One of the problems is, is that when you get down to the fundamental elements of matter, they turn out not to be very much like matter at all. They turn out to be these weird quantum processes and entities that appear to be tangled up with consciousness in some way that no one can understand and certainly display all sorts of properties that aren't evident at the macro level. So, you know, the formal job of reductionism, which is you, or one element of reductionism, because there's many elements of reductionism, is that you explain the complex by the simple, and you know, for a long time as we went deeper into the microstructure of things, it did appear in some sense to be getting simpler, but then when we went down to the quantum level, it all of a sudden got incredibly weird and no one really knows what to do about that. Now, I'm not going to introduce quantum thinking into this discussion because you know, every weirdo with a crockpot theory immediately, immediately does that, and it's a very dangerous thing to do. I'm just pointing out that we didn't expect for the nature of reality to qualitatively transform as we investigated the microstructure, but that's what happened. So, okay, all of that aside, the idea that truth, that there are facts about material reality and that those facts are true is a very, very powerful idea. However, we don't pursue it because the rationale for pursuing that truth is based on truths that are different from the truths that the process itself reveals. So, you know, and I think, you know, you, you might well agree, hypothetically, that perhaps investigating how to combine Ebola with smallpox is not really a good idea from a science, perfect idea from a scientific perspective. But there, it seems not unreasonable to assume that there's a broader perspective from which that idea probably isn't for the best. You know, now, a pure scientist, there isn't such a thing, but if there was, might say it doesn't matter because all facts are equal because facts don't have value. You know, they're, they're not valenced, so all facts are equal. But of course, you can't live like all facts are equal because there's a trillion facts. And if you don't have some mechanism to zero you in on a subset of relevant facts, it's like you're immobilized, you know. You're just flooded by information. I think something like that probably happens to people in the initial stages of schizophrenia.
So they can't distinguish, everything becomes relevant, that's a bad situation So, so you know, you're stuck with a subset of facts anyways And there are reasons that you choose the subset of facts that you choose And those reasons aren't grounded in a materialist philosophy And they can't be, at least not in any simple way Okay, so, maybe, you know, hopefully that's a coherent argument Now, the next part of it is kind of something interesting that happened in the late 1800s so, in the late 1800s, there were a group of philosophers on the east coast of the United States uh, that called themselves pragmatists, and William James was one of those people and William James is, of course, regarded as one of the founders of modern psychology even though he was a... he wouldn't be allowed on a faculty of psychology today because he, he, was, like, he was like the first hippie, you know, in some sense because he liked to experiment with things like uh, laughing gas He was very curious about Phenomena like religious experience and so forth So he was a very philosophically minded psychologist and, and had some very... Well, he was brave, I would say, you know Which sometimes being weird and being brave are the same thing He was also unbelievably intelligent And he had a group of people around him Including a guy named Charles Peirce Who's one of the, one of the West's greatest relatively unknown philosophers Anyways, they set up a new field of, of philosophy Which is... Classically regarded as the only American philosophy And that philosophy was pragmatism You know, and when you call someone pragmatic You sort of mean, well, they're willing to do what works You know, they're concerned with what works And that's kind of pragmatism in a nutshell in some sense Except it's a lot more sophisticated The pragmatist would say Look, you've got a problem And the problem is you don't know everything And what that means in some sense is that All of your knowledge about anything is limited even about the things that you think you know about It's limited And so you can never be sure You can never be certain that what you're dealing with is what you think you're dealing with Or that when you deal with it What you expect to happen will happen And so, you know, you might think Well, I understand my... Um, you know, I understand this can of Coke sufficiently uh, I can drink it and so on And so my knowledge is as close to absolute as it needs to be But, you know, this has aspartame in it and, Everybody thinks aspartame is dangerous, but it's probably not But probably it's not You know, and so Who knows, if I drink a hundred of these things, that might be the end of me And wouldn't that be stupid? So, the point is, is that because you're surrounded by A cloud of ignorance that you cannot get rid of None of your judgments about what constitutes truth can be final And so one of the things the pragmatists were trying to figure out is Well, given that, how can you even act? Because you, you can't compute, well, and this came up again in the 1960s and has really bothered people since then in the guise of the frame problem is you cannot compute all the consequences of your actions So how can you act? How can you feel that you have enough knowledge to act? So, well, it's a very difficult problem It's an unbelievably difficult problem It's actually one of the problems that has made developing intelligent machines much more difficult than anyone thought it would be because it turns out that not only are there an infinite number of things that could happen as a consequence of a given action There's also a virtually infinite number of ways to look at a situation, to perceive it We look at a situation and there it is, and so we just think it's given But it turns out that that's just seriously wrong And the only reason that when we look at the world that it's given is because our psyche, our consciousness Which we still think of as sort of a soul, is actually Something that is grounded deeply in the biological processes of our body And that all of those biological processes that were created over evolutionary time Structure our perceptions before we even know it and just deliver this world to us So it looks obvious, but you know, it took... Well, we've been evolving for like three billion years or something like that So it took a lot of tinkering around to get this perceptual system to do what it does So, okay, so they're very interested in... in, in how you came up with ideas of truth and what they what they settled on roughly speaking is something like whenever you con whenever you conduct an action you set up the criteria for determining whether what you're doing is is reasonable or factual based on the outcome that you want to attain and so for the pragmatists it was more like things were true enough and so if my goal in interacting with this coke can is to have a drink and when I do what I, I'm going to do and I get a drink, then that's sufficiently true and I can go on to the next thing So, but it's still tenuous because it, it leaves open other questions like should I be drinking this or something else or, you know, 
whatever, it leaves open all sorts of questions, but it doesn't matter as far as the pragmatists are concerned. Now, when Darwin published his theory, the pragmatists got on it right away. They were really interested in Darwinian theory because they regarded it as a version of pragmatism, which is quite cool. And they did this within, I think, within five years of its publication. You know, it caused quite a, quite a stir. People were sort of ready for the theory. But the pragmatists were really all over it because they thought of the mechanism that Darwin described to account for evolution as a pragmatic mechanism. Now, that's an interesting idea. So think about it this way. So, how much do you need to know? Well, from a Darwinian perspective, there's an answer to that. You need to know enough so that you can last long enough to pass your genes to the next generation. That's it. And the Darwinians would also say, well, obviously your knowledge is faulty and incomplete because you know, your ability to transmit your genetic material to the next generation is somewhat limited you know, you have a limited number of partners plus you die! and the fact that you die indicates that you, as a solution to the problem of um, of maintaining your own life and reproducing, you're like a partial solution, you're a good enough solution, you'll do for like the 30 years or the 35 years or the 40 years that you're likely to be active in a, you know, in a functionally reproductive sense so you're a good enough answer, and, but, you know, the Darwinians and the pragmatists also said something else or implied something else, which is you're good enough and also not only is that as good as it gets it's also as good as it can get so they put some really stringent restrictions on what would what you could regard as a sufficient solution to a given problem and the reason for that was that well, that your knowledge is limited and that things transform unexpectedly and so the best thing you could do is run along and try to keep up and you'll never really do much better than that, in some sense because things are unpredictable and because they change in an unpredictable way so, now the final part of the argument is this so then, what are we to regard as truth? Now, leave the materialist claims aside. I'm perfectly willing to say, and I think it would be ridiculous not to, that that's a form of truth that at least is very useful. So, fine, it's a tool. It may be more than that. It may, maybe it is saying something about the absolute nature of reality. I don't care about that. At least it's a useful tool for us. It's made us more powerful. But then we have this other problem, which is, well, what about the nature of the system that it's embedded in? Like, how do we determine its utility? Or how do we determine the utility of anything? Or how do we determine how to act? Or how do we determine what to value? And those questions can't be asked using this, answered using the same methodology that science uses to answer its questions.